Zechariah chapter 4. I'm going to read it from the Amplified Version. I usually read passages in several different versions of the Bible. Thank God for uh, apps because they give you like a whole lot of versions. And I do that because I want to, at face value, get the clarity of the scripture before digging. And in verse 1 it says, And the angel who talked with me came again and awakened me like a man who was wakened out of his sleep. You see, it seems that Zechariah was exhausted. He was exhausted spirit, soul, and body. He had just seen four visions. I, I don't know about you, but if the Lord has ever revealed anything to you by a vision, when you came out of that place of vision, even though you weren't really asleep, it was like you were asleep. You felt tired and exhausted. I, I, I won't forget that Apostle Fenton uh, would say to us after we would do ministry that we should go and we should rest. Don't go and visit Jane and Sue and Bill and Bobby and go to the movies or go to the skating rink or any, you know, rest yourself because of the pouring out. And so what was happening with Zechariah was a lot of pouring in. It was heavy, the things that God was showing him. And in verse 2, it says, And he said, and, and said to me, What do you see? This is the angel that has come to Zechariah. He's asking him, What do you see? He said, I said, I see and behold a lampstand of gold with its bowls for oil on the top of it and its seven lamps on it. And there are seven pipes to each of the seven lamps which are upon the type of it. Now, I don't know if you have it up there. You see those references? You might want to write them down and look at them later. Then in verse 3 it says, And there are two olive trees by it. So, okay, you see the candlestick. Are you seeing it in your mind's eye? It's got seven branches, but then next to it are these two olive trees. And there are two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side of it, feeding it continuously with oil. Now picture it in your mind's eye, here's the candlestick, above it is this bowl Beside it are these two trees and pipes that are feeding into the bowl that goes into the candlestick. It's the visionary candlestick of gold with its seven lamps. Are you seeing it? It's a figurative representation of the seven branch golden stick, golden candlestick in the tabernacle. It differs from that of the tabernacle in three ways. First of all, it had a bowl on top. If you remember, in the tabernacle, there was no bowl on top. The lamps were filled by the priest at the top. The candlestick of the tabernacle had no pipes feeding into it, but only seven arms for the purpose of holding the lamps. The olive trees on the right and the left of the oil vessel supplied it with oil required to light it continually without the intervention of man. You remember the candlesticks in the tabernacle, the priest had to go in. In this vision, there's no human, inter there's no human intervention. There's no man required to supply it with oil. It was supplied by no human agency. And in the tabernacle, the pure oil was brought to the priest. Remember, God commanded them to bring pure oil. But in this vision, the oil is flowing from these two trees. The oil represents who? Who? The Holy Spirit who fills and empowers us to do his will and to do it his way. Amen? And so this lampstand is made of gold, which represents 
that it is precious in God's sight. Gold is a precious metal to God. As a matter of fact, he's saying what he's doing with us is making us so that we come forth as pure gold, unalloyed, not contaminated by any other metal, just pure gold. And the oil is also pure, and it's meant to shed its light around at all times. It is never meant to go out. It is meant to be shining always and forever. And we as Christians are to be honorable vessels. You know, the scripture talks about vessels in the house, that there are some of honor and some of dishonor, but God has called you and me to be uh, honorable vessels of gold, unalloyed, uncontaminated by the world, precious metal. And he also has called us to shed light in the world. In Matthew 5:14 it says you are the light of the world. Are you? Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You're in that workplace and you say it's dark in here, but God says you have the light. Let your light shine that they may see that I am the God who reigns, that I am the God that the worship team sang about this morning. Let your light shine, not just sometime, but always. <clears throat> Verse 4, so I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Now, I'm just thinking right now that all of you by now are seeing the picture of what these really are. And it seems that Zechariah was not just asking about the two olive trees, but the whole vision. And sometimes we're looking at something that the Lord is showing us, and we, like Zechariah, don't get it. What am I looking at here, Lord? What you trying to show me? We don't see what the Lord is showing us. The, the fact that he sees the two olive trees feeding into the seven branches of the candlestick without any human intervention was not a clue to him. Duh. It seems he didn't make the connection. And you know, I'm not talking about Zechariah. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about us, because I know I'm not in this alone. And sometimes I have to say to myself, duh. It seems he did not make the connection that the oil coming from the olive trees was from God and not from man. Because in the temple, you know, the candlestick, they didn't have any pipes running into it to feed any oil from the trees. No bowl on top to catch the oil and then the pipes running from the bowl into the seven candles, uh, 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 arms. Didn't have that. Then the angel who talked with me, verse 5, answered me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me, this addition of the bowl to the candlestick, causing it to yield a ceaseless supply of oil from the olive trees, is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, of whom the oil is a symbol, says the Lord of hosts. He's letting Zechariah know that the oil being poured in is without any human intervention and is a symbol of the Holy Ghost getting involved in the rebuilding of the temple in a way that will not require any human effort. Of course God calls us to do things. I don't mean it in that sense. He gives us what to do, but I always say, I'm the glove and he's the hand. He who has called you is faithful, and he will also do it. It doesn't mean we're supposed to go somewhere and sit down and God's going to do it all. No, that's not what this is saying. 
It's saying, don't think that you have the might or the power to do it on your own. You are the glove and God is the hand. And that's what I'm saying when I say new, no human intervention. Doesn't mean that they're not working because over in Haggai, he says, uh, do the work and I'm gonna be with you. Which meant they had to pick up a hammer or a nail or whatever other tool that builders use. Zerubbabel must have thought the enemy certainly was a force to be reckoned with because that enemy stopped the rebuilding of that temple for 16 years, even though the king, Cyrus, gave him permission to do it. And in addition to the enormity of the work to be done, he must have also thought how little resources there are to do this work. Anybody know anything about that? Lord, you want me to do this, but I got nothing. God wanted to show Zerubbabel, God wanted Zerubbabel to know the work he was calling to him to do was by God's grace alone. There's a song called Grace Alone, and it talks about how we as the people of God who serve God go out into the world and, and we deliver the word, and uh, it's by God's grace alone that people get saved. People get healed, people get delivered. No army was needed. No external power was required. And despite formidable opposition, God wanted Zerubbabel to know that it was the divine aid of the Holy Ghost that was going to accomplish the building of the temple. Now you get your hammers and nails together and your material for building, but God's going to do the work. Verse 7, then he goes on to say, For who are you, O great mountain of human obstacles? As I was coming in today, I, I heard the song, uh, uh, the person singing the song say that uh, death in the grave is a mountain. I said, I know that's true if you ain't saved. <laughs> death and the grave is a mountain. But then he goes on. Who are you, O oh great mountain of human obstacles? Death in the grave is not a human obstacle. That's huge. But because we're saved, it's like a molehill. It's like a plain. It's flattened out because we know where we're going. And then he goes on to say, before Zerubbabel, who with Joshua had led the return of the exiles from Babylon and was undertaking the rebuilding of the temple before him, you shall become a plain, a mere molehill, and he shall bring forth the finishing gable stone of the new temple with loud shoutings of people crying, grace, grace to it. Hallelujah. He's telling them all the obstacles that stand before Zerubbabel will be removed. All the obstacles that stand before you, Miss Tommy, are being removed. All the obstacles that stand before you, Mary, are removed. All of the obstacles that stand before you, Pastor A, are removed. Apostle Fenton, all the obstacles that stand before you are removed. They are leveled. In verse 8, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundations of this house. His hands shall also finish it. Then you shall know, recognize, and understand that the Lord of hosts has sent me his messenger to you. You see, God wanted the completion of the temple and the restoration of worship. He wanted the completion of the temple and the restoration of worship place for the people to come together to be able to worship him to be able to acknowledge him as the God who reigns over all the God who is in control the God who governs and controls everything that he has made he wants the people to be able to come together and worship that God not the mother gods that they made with hands with the same wood they burned a fire and cooked food the true and the living God 
and God ordained for it to be completed. But fear and opposition stopped it. Verse 10. <laughs> I love this part. Who, with reason, despises the day of small things? For these seven shall rejoice when they see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel. Now, I don't know if you all have that picture that I gave you of the plummet. How many of you know what a plummet is? Or a plumb line? Where are the builders in the house? Let me see your hands if you're a builder in this house. Construction, I see one hand, two hands, or three hands. All right, we got people in the house who know what a plummet is, a plumb line, right? There it is. That's a string, and at the bottom of that string is a weight, and that weight is pointed. It is a vertical device. It's so simple, isn't it? but is a major piece of a builder's toolkit. It measures vertically, but it helps you to see from left to right if anything is at a line. You see, God has a line. Pastor Aubrey, who is a builder, talked about this so eloquently before. I hope you all heard that message and remember that. I'm not a builder. But I do understand this part of the principle. But the th here's the thing that I'm looking at. This vertical relationship has to be straight. It's got to be right in order for all this horizontal stuff to be in line. Now, I know Pastor Aubrey also talked about the cornerstone, okay, and how everything needed to be lined up and everything. But this thing is telling me vertically. I got to be lined up vertically. I've got to be anchored. That's the weight at the bottom. In order for everything else in my life, my relationships, the way I do my work, how I talk to people, how I interact with folks, how I do things behind closed doors where nobody is seeing, all that has to line up. And then he goes on to say, these seven are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. One of my favorite passages is, that, uh, I don't know the address right now, but it says that the Lord's eyes roam to and fro upon the earth, seeking on whose behalf he may show himself strong. I'm like this. Me, me, you see me? Now kids are in class, me, me. The day of small things. It's easy to become discourage when we see how little we can do and how little we have to do it with. It's easy to become discouraged. And, and the ones who had seen the temple, well, they, they saw the altar, they saw the foundation, yeah, that's good, all right. But then now when these people come about, it ain't good enough. They cut and run for 16 years. They were stopped and they were legitimately stopped. And they thought, we got no power. What about God? You're right, you've got no power. This was a case in Judea where a relatively insignificant temple was being built to replace Solomon's magnificent edifice. But days of small things are beginnings, not endings. What does he say to them in Haggai, the latter house? It's going to be better than the former. It's going to be more magnificent, more glorious. When we step out faithfully to do the small things God calls us to, the Lord has a way of making them and us great small things like that mustard seed, small thing, encoded with greatness, became such a big tree that the birds came in and nest. Well, now, was the tree there for the birds? No. Come to kingdom class and you'll find out more about that. For all, that, all of you who haven't had kingdom class, you know how on the internet they put a commercial in between the preaching 
This is a commercial January for all of you who have not had kingdom. Verse 11. Then I said to him, the angel who talked with me, what are these two olive trees on the right side of the lampstand and on the left side of the lampstand? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but did you hear that question? Did you hear him ask that question before? It's almost like Zechariah realizes that he's already asked this question and then rephrases the question. And a second time I said to him, what are these two olive branches which are beside the two golden tubes or sprouts by which the golden oil is emptied? And he answered me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two sons of oil. Now, we, we heard in the New Testament, the sons of thunder. These are the two sons of oil, Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, the prince of Judah, the two anointed ones. If you will allow me the liberty that church and state are working together on this one. That's why for those of you who work in government, know that God has planted you there. That's where your ministry is. You are anointed to be there so that you can bring about and advance the kingdom of God in that workplace, in that government place. Then he said, these are the two sons of the oil, Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the prince of Judah, the anointed ones who stand before the Lord of the whole earth as his anointed instruments. Do you know that God has appointed instruments in the earth that stand before him? And out of their innermost being flows rivers of living water? The two anointed ones, the authorities, the priestly system and the regal system or the governing system that bear the oil of the anointing are intimately connected. That's why Jesus said, when they said, why are you talking to them in parables? He said, because it was given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom and not them. Because God had intended for his people to rule and to reign in government systems, in healthcare systems, in economic systems, in business systems, in educational systems, that God's people would rule. Not the world with their distorting thoughts about who God is, who you are, and even who they are. So in their unity, church and state, the priestly, and the governmental. God's channel of divine grace and the source of light to the world flows freely to and through the priestly and governmental systems. And because they are instituted by God, they can carry out his will in ordering things the way they should be ordered according to God has an order for everything. If your body gets out of order, that's called sickness and disease or crippling. God has an order for everything, has an order for how your family is run, has an order for how you should live day to day. God has an order for everything, and he uses his servants to deliver the word to all of us as to what that order is. So these servants are ruling, they are ordering, they are guiding, they are extending and purifying his kingdom among men. This is why Jesus said that. It's given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom, not them. And to him who has, even more shall be given. He says that too. But to him, and he shall have an abundance. This is not just about money. How about discernment? How about instruction, direction? Which way should I go? Should I sell this house or should I put more money in it to fix it up? Should I sell this car? Yes. Ain't putting any more money into it. The mechanic already told me, it's over.
God will supply all your needs through his spirit and all the strength that you need to su succeed, he's going to give you. He will do it through you because he chose you. He chose you. He said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. That you would do what? Bear fruit. Bear fruit how? More abundantly. By my spirit. I think I forgot to tell you, that's the, the name of the message. <laughs> By my spirit means we rely not on our own strength and ability or talents or gifts, but on the spirit of God. Get back to that thing God told you to do. I know God told you to do something. Get back to it. Because it won't let you go until you re-engage with it. When God gives you something to do, no matter what opposition or challenges arise before you, God is telling you to do the work, and he is with you. Do the work. I'm with you every step of the way. I remember in 1990, I organized the worship conference, and I invited one of the foremost leaders in worship at that time who was living in Texas for him to come to Philadelphia. And I don't remember if it was the day of or the day before when I heard the weather forecast, it was supposed to snow, it was supposed to be a snowstorm up and down the eastern seaboard. There were hundreds of people who had registered for the conference. They were coming as far as Virginia and Philadelphia and the surrounding counties and states. And I remember I was driving on Lincoln Drive. How many of you know Lincoln Drive? It goes like this. I'm on Lincoln Drive, and I heard the Lord say, I will work, and who can hinder or reverse it? Isaiah 43, 13, I will work, and who will hinder or reverse it? When we get in there and do the work that God has called us to do, if God has called us to do that work, he has ordained for that work to be not unfinished, but finished, because he's working through us, and no one can hinder or reverse it, no matter what the challenge. God has given or will give you something to do. Don't let the adversary orchestrate uh, adverse circumstances and turn you back from it. The work may look small as a mustard seed, but you know that tiny seed is encoded with greatness, as I said before. It may look small. Despise not the day of small beginnings. Understand that it's not by any human intervention or invention that will bring you success, but it's by God's might, by God's power, by God's spirit that you will prosper in that thing, whatever it is that God has given you to do. Turn back to it and re-engage with it. Amen? I'm going to read you the last part of the words of this song. The last part of the song says, My fortress my refuge, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. My helper, defender, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. Then it kind of goes, oh, someone let the people know anything is possible. Then they say, no weapon will prosper, still a strong tower. Still a strong tower, my fortress, my refuge, still a strong tower, still a strong tower, tower, my helper, defender, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. Oh, someone let the devil know, tell him that he's got to go. No weapon will prosper. He is still a strong tower. He is still a strong tower. Amen. Is he a strong tower for you? Sing with me. Not by power, not by might, by the spirit of the living, spirit of the living God. Come on, no. Not my battle, not my fight, by the spirit of the living spirit of the living one more time not by power not by might by the spirit of the living spirit of the living God. not my battle not, not
some of you watching by the internet have been in this battle and been in this fight not knowing that it's not yours. God's the one who called you to do that thing, whatever that thing is. For those of you that are here, God's the one who called you to do that thing. Yep, it's big. But does God ever do anything really small? He may start small, but in that little tiny seed is encoded with greatness. I remember when the Lord in June told me to step out and start a practice. I'm a marriage and family therapist also. And I said, Lord, that's like starting a business. And it was going to be in this place in Delaware County where I, I don't really know anybody and don't know anybody who could refer me. But he told me to do it and I was scared. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And I was to start on June 5th. I became one of the affiliates in a group. The group is called Kairos, which is a Greek word, which means time, not chronological time but the time that Jesus was talking about when he said, I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks, but you wouldn't, you would not. You didn't want it. And this was the time and you've lost it. It's gone. So on June 5th, I went in and I sat in the office all by myself and I had work to do. But I want you to know, I put up and I never did anything. I put a profile up on psychology today. And that was the last day I sat in my office alone. The Lord sent me client after client after client after client after client after client. And now I'm looking at my schedule trying to figure out where I can fit people. Not by might. Amen. Not by power. Yes but God, by God's spirit, he told me to do it. And I'm thinking, Lord, I'm like almost 100 years old, okay? And I'm gonna start something like this at this time of my life? And Lord said, yes. And I stepped out there on that limb and it has not broken. Hallelujah. I'm saying that to you so that it's not about me telling you a little story about me. It's about instilling hope. Yes. With every one of my clients, that is one of my change processes. Hope changes things. Amen. If you have hope, hope in God. And if you've been feeling a little weak in that area, I want to pray for you. If you want to come to the altar, I will pray for you. The ministers that are here, they will pray for you too. I'm the first one at the altar, even though I'm standing here. Is there anyone else? God gave you something to do. And you need to do it. And you can do it. Because it's not by might nor power, but by God's spirit. Amazing God. Not thing I like about God is that he sees you. He sees you. He sees you. He cares about you. He cares for you. He who has called you is faithful and he will also do it. I'm going to ask the ministers if you would come and just kind of walk through and just people as a symbol of God's anointing upon their lives. God has anointed you. There are rivers of living water that are in you. God wants that to pour out of you because you're going to change life around you. Holy God, most high God, we thank you that we don't have to ask you to come here. You're already here. Move in and among your people today. I bind the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus. I bind the spirit of doubt 
in the name of Jesus. I bind the spirit of anxiety in the name of Jesus. Lord, you have chosen a path for each and, what, each and every one of these who stand before you today, O oh Lord, and you intend for them to follow that path. God, I pray that you would give them keen discernment that when they are looking at what you are showing them, that they will see it for what it is and not wonder about what is this, Lord, but that they would know. Lord, I bind a spirit of trickery in their lives. I bind the assignment of Satan against them that would try to show them that shiny thing out there that looks good but is not. Uh, Lord, I loose the power of them having the discernment that is needed, oh God, to know which door to go in because sometimes there are several doors open and which one do I go through, Lord, because they all look good. But only one of the five is really good, oh Lord. Show me that one. Help them, O oh Lord, to follow in the path that you have carved out for them because before the foundation of the world, you had a way for them to go, O oh God. Show them what that way is. I loose the power of the great anointing of influence in the world in which they live, the context in which they live, a great anointing for influence, influence for you, dear God, influence people to come into the kingdom of God, influence people to look up and not look down, oh Lord, look up to where you can be found, oh God, that they may find deliverance for their souls, because out of these who stand before you, you have put water, living water, through which it will flow to other people and bring healing, bring deliverance, bring salvation, bring hope. Lord, let your light never be dim in any of these, oh Lord. Let your light shine so brightly that it will attract people to them, that they will be able to tell a part of their story of what they know about you, how you are the God who never fails them, how you are the God who is always there, how you are the God who has healed them countless times, how you are the God who has protected, protected them when they were defenseless to protect themselves, how you are the God who turned that car away that looked like it was coming at them to crash into them, how you are the God that turned that person back that was trying to harm them, how you are the God who heals them when people speak words to them that wound them in the depths of their souls, oh Lord, that you are the God who is always there, oh Lord. Help them to bring hope to a world around them by relaying that message, oh God, the message that they have received themselves, oh Lord. And now concerning the work that you've given them to do, help them to know that it's gonna stick with them until they do it. They will never get satisfaction until they do what you call them to do. Lord, just put like a hedge of thorns around them that whichever way that they try to go that is not the way in which you are leading them, they will feel the prickly thorns poking at them, the uncomfortability of it, and they'll say, I give up. Giving up to you, Lord. Up to you. Giving up to you. That's what you want them to do. Give up to you. Lift their hands up to you that you may grab their hands and pull them up, O oh Lord. I thank you, O oh God, that they will go and be bold as a lion and do what you have called them to do. Lord, remind them that the devil has a system of helping them to do what you've called them to do, but doing it his way. I bind that spirit of distraction. I bind that false spirit that would try to come to them and say, do it this way. Let their eyes be open immediately, oh God, that they may see. That's not the way. That's not God's way. I'm following God's way. Are you following God's way? Say yes. Amen, Lord. Amen, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, if you're in here and... You said, I've been living life on my own terms. How's that working for you? And your answer may be, it's not working real well. I, I need a savior, not just to give me fire insurance to keep me from burning in hell forever and ever and ever, 
but I need a savior and a God who will help me to live the abundant life while I'm living on this earth instead of a life of misery. If that's you, I want to see your hand. Are you in this house today? And if you're online, I want you to give notice to us. There may be a number on the screen that you can call. Let us know that you accepted Jesus today. And if you're sitting there and you don't raise your hand or I didn't see your hand, when you go out, there's a desk on the left as you leave the sanctuary. Let them know, I accepted Christ today. Amen? God bless you. You may be seated. 